How are you? I got to tell you, I haven't hung out with you guys for a couple of years, and this crowd, I don't know how you do it. You're bright-eyed and you're bushy-tailed, except for Ed. He's trying really hard, though. Give him a round of applause, because he's here center front again today. Thank you. <laughs> We're in the Black Hills, um, but I have to tell you the story about where I come from. The other day when I asked you to think about the person who inspires you, who inspired you to believe that you could do more than you thought you could do, that, that person who helped you decide you could be a leader, I have to share with you my own story of that. This is a farm that was in my family, and you see that old pump? I don't know what that thing weighs, but all these years, nobody has taken that. I was up there last fall. It's still there, as are the buildings. That's a view of the prairie about a mile from where I grew up in northeastern South Dakota. And this is the only picture I have of me with snow as a little girl on the farm. It's black and white, of course, that's how pictures were taken back. This is maybe like 1959, I was born in 56, so it's an old picture. And that barn was red, and um, it's my dad and my brother and me on that sled. Um, would you please stand up if you grew up having an older brother in your life? Stand up if you grew up having an older brother in your life. Now please remain standing if when you were kids, you did whatever he told you to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. I feel your pain. I was about five years old with my brother up by that old red barn one day when he said, grab the electric fence with both hands. And because my mom trusted me in his care, he's four years older than I am, I did whatever he told me to do. I was about eight years old when to the right of that old barn was a, a, a water pump and a pipe that carried water to the cattle tank. And it was, you know, like January on the prairie when my brother said, you know, I think you'd really like the taste of that pipe. <laughs> yeah, and you know what happened then. So I grew up trusting my brother and really trusting my dad, and I loved, loved, loved going out with my dad to check cattle. He had like a Hereford cattle farm. And so that was my, my world growing up in northeastern South Dakota. But believe it or not, when I was a little girl, I was kind of obsessed with something. I was about nine or 10 years old when I wanted to know what I would be the rest of my life. And as a little girl growing up in the prairie back then, there were really two choices. I could be a teacher, or I could be a nurse. That's really all that was besides being a housewife, and I knew I didn't want to be a mom even then. <laughs> so I became a mom later on. But So I looked at my third grade teacher when I was about nine years old, and I knew that I didn't want to look like her. She had her black hair pulled back into a really tight bun. She had black curly bangs, black horn rim glasses, and she was, let's just say, very, very well endowed and wore dresses that went like straight down to the floor. And I thought, I don't want to look like that when I'm old. That's all I remember is I didn't want to look like that. But I really did not want to become a nurse. The conundrum for me with that was that my dad's mother from Oslo was a nurse. So I had all these well-meaning Norwegian relatives who, who would say, Ah, oh, yeah, Didi, you should be a nurse. Yeah, be a nurse like Grandma Olga. I hated hospitals. Every time I got injured on the farm, and I was a tomboy, so I was always hurting something, I would go to the hospital and they would give me this awful tasting cherry medicine. You know that flavor? <laughs> to this day, it's like, yuck. So, so I was stressed and, um, and I would go out with my dad checking cattle and really enjoy those, those idyllic days. The, dad's pasture was just virgin prairie, big, big chunk of land. Well, raise your hand if you had a father like mine. My dad, in the pickup, with his arm on the door, window down, could roll a cigarette without stopping the vehicle. <laughs> Anybody else have that? He, we probably only went 10, 15 miles an hour. He'd take the cigarette papers out of this pocket, put it in his hand, tap it down to create a groove. With this hand, he would take the Prince Albert can out of this pocket, 
put it into the groove, put the can lid back on, put it in this pocket, lick the paper, put the unlicked edge over the licked edge, tap it down, seal both ends, put it in his mouth, and strike a match. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm out there with my dad. Now, I grew up thinking that's completely normal behavior, right? <laughs> that was like, okay, I just... And I didn't do that myself then, but I knew I, just what dad was doing. So one day, we are out in this beautiful, idyllic pasture. And it's just this beautiful scene of South Dakota prairie and the cattle, and I'm with my dad. But I was stressed about what I would be when I grew up. And so I turned to my dad, and I just blurted out, Dad, what should I be when I grow up? And this World War II surviving farmer turned to me very gently and said, well, you can be anything you want to be. Oh. And so my dad that day allowed me to say, I can create my future. And so I ask you, hopefully with the flip, oh, please. All right. What, what do you want for your future? And that's a question I asked quite a few young people this week especially. What do you want for the future? Because I wanted to know what they thought. And I asked a few adults. And because I've been around you guys once or twice, I think I know some of what you want. I think you want to always be able to see incredible, breathtaking beauty like this on a sled. I mean, think about some of the places you've been, some of the things you've seen from New Brunswick to the mountains, More mountain scenes that are just like, I mean, they just take your breath away. They're so spectacular. I think I'm going to need a new battery here shortly. And I think you also want to always be able to ride with people that you love. So I think that's what you want. And I think you want more kids involved. All the adults I asked this week, one of the first things that came up was, we want more youth involved. We want more kids involved in snowmobiling. Years ago, I flew into Wichita to work with a hospital in Kansas. And in the Wichita, I saw a billboard for a bank. The billboard had a picture of the bank logo, a picture of commercial business going on, and only these three words, ask, listen, solve. I think that's a wonderful model for leadership when you're looking at creating your future to ask people, like I asked people this week, what do you want this sport to look like in 5, 10, 20 years? And so, <clears throat> just like we did the other morning, I want you to find a person who agrees to work with you, preferably not your spouse, because we want your marriage to last past tonight. So pick somebody else, and whoever has been to the Black Hills the most of your partnership gets to go first. And I want you just to share with each other, what do you really want for this sport? If you look down the road 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what do you really hope this sport looks like then? So with your partner, hopefully not your spouse, who's ever been here the most, gets to go first, and just talk for like a minute. What do you really want this sport to look like in the future? I hate to cut off that discussion. I think that's, that's such an important question. What do you really want for your future? And when you ask each other and you listen to what you say, then you know, you've, you've got some problems to solve. Your problems are huge. That's why I said the other day, you know, if this was easy, everybody would be here, but you are the ones here. You are the ones who are the leaders of this sport. And so it is incumbent upon you that you ask that question and listen to what people say and then solve that problem together. Together with, with people. As leaders, engage as many people as you can in that process. And engagement, engaging is one of those key words I heard from lots of people this week. Now, my little research here is nothing scientific, nothing that would stand up to any kind of scrutiny, maybe a modified focus group, some interviews I conducted, but I did talk to some people. And I think it is common. Adults and kids alike said they want more youth involvement. That's one of the themes that I heard over and over. And so, whoops, point there. I, talked, I went to this group's session. Anybody raise your hand if you saw these kids talk this week. That was very powerful. And 
there's like five of them in this group, and I got a chance to interview them last night. Kids and adults on sleds. It's a program based in Wisconsin. And these kids are great kids. Over the past 10 years, guess how many kids have gone through that program? This is a leadership training program for youth to get more involved in snowmobiling leadership in Wisconsin. How many kids do you think have gone through that program in 10 years? The answer would be 100, is what they told me last night. Yeah, round of applause. <clears throat> How would the future of snowmobiling look different in your state if you had had, for the past 10 years, 100 kids go through a leadership training program that led to them becoming like the president of one of the clubs already. And I said, so is the young club? She goes, no, we got a lot of old people in there. <laughs> They're great. They're so honest and so... But this is what they said when I asked them, what do you hope snowmobiling looks like? And I said, when, when you are older and maybe you have kids. And they said, they hope it grows in popularity. And they said they hope that more people get involved and that it remains always a family sport. That word was very important to these kids. That it's always about families. And that it um, becomes more affordable. I mean, think about kids. I don't even know what snowmobiles cost. That's always Kim's deal. He buys them if we have them. But I don't know. But I know it's, it's more than $25. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. But, but these kids want to be able to afford it. You know, that's one of their goals. And then they want the reputation of the sport to be really good. And they reference that with drinking. They want to be a positive image and reputation. And one of them said, well, they like it just like it is. Just they want more of it. They want more days to ride, more places to ride. So that was, isn't that a good list? Give those kids a round of applause. And those kids have been here like all week doing things, and this morning they are riding ATVs in the Badlands, so good for them. So they're not here. But when you see them later on tonight, I'd love you to say good job to those kids, okay? Then I talked to this group of kids from, I, I think the club is called Trail Busters. Did I get that right? From southeast, southeast corner of South Dakota. And um, I, we, um, Jaya, wherever he is, videotaped them. And so I'm going to have you see what they talk to me about with someone billing. Well, good morning. I'm here with a wonderful group of kids from the Trail Busters Snowmobile Club um, located in southeastern South Dakota. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves to you first, okay? So we'll start right here. Um, I'm Riley Johnson, 15. I've been riding since age three. I'm Rachel Watkins. I'm 15. I've been riding since age three. I'm Robert Watkins, age 10, and I've been riding since age 3. I'm Taylor Watkins, I'm 19, and I've also been riding since age 3. I'm Lexi Johnson, and I'm 18, and I've also been riding since age 3. So these guys are all seasoned riders at the ripe old ages of 18 and 10 and 15, so they've got a lot of experience. I wanted to ask them what they love about this sport because they've got such great experience. So I'm going to have each one just tell you what they love most about snowmobiling. The, uh, the adrenaline rush is always the best part about snowmobiling, and I always like to get that feeling. I think the family aspect, being able to be with your family and getting closer. Um, also the friends that you meet through snowmobiling and the sights that you see. I also like the scenery when we go snowmobiling. It's always wonderful. I like the social aspect, getting to meet new people and just talking with them about their experiences and promoting the sport. I love the family part of it, getting to, getting to meet new friends, the scenery, and just having an awesome time. So they talked a lot about family and friends and the scenery and having great places to ride. I, I asked them also to think about what, what gets in the way of having, having great places to ride. What are, they, what are the challenges that they see the, the sport is facing today? And here's what they have to say about that. Some of the challenges are that places are getting gated off and people are being told to stay out and some of them aren't really listening to it and just making it worse. 
Um, some of the challenges are that we don't have as many youth as used to ride, and um, our generation is just kind of forgetting about snowmobiling and how important it is. Oh. Some people aren't being as safe and, like, riding too fast and riding where they're not supposed to. Um, I think we really need to get the young people involved with the organizational snowmobiling, not just going out and doing it, but getting involved and seeing how much really goes behind um, promoting the sport and keeping the areas they love open. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is that the younger kids, like Robert's age, they don't get to go out and experience it. They don't have a club to go to. They don't have people that are backing them up to do it. So I just think that we should go back into those generations and try and get them on a snowmobile and just have them go tootle around and have some fun. So now I'm going to put these intelligent, wise snowmobilers on the spot. And I'm going to ask them, since they are kids, and since the future of the sport seems to hinge on kids getting to really love the sport and engage in the sport, what makes that more possible? What makes kids want to get involved? So can everybody come up with a suggestion on that one for us? What worked for you? And what do you think might work for others? Um... I guess going fast is always fun on anything. <laughs> we have a speed game. Um, as uh, you build friendships with other people in snowmobiling, just encourage your friends to come with you on a trip and just to see how it is, and maybe they'll talk their family into getting a snowmobile just to ride around their house and then make it grow into the whole family does it, and then they join different groups and clubs. Um, older generation encouragement. So, like, the kids have people to, or people have been snowmilling to back them up and tell them how fun it is and stuff. I think the older generation really, like, promoting, like, how long they've snowmobiled and, like, all these organizations they've set up and what really needs to happen to keep them going and how important partnerships are with, like, the game fishing parks and just showing that we really need them to keep snowmobiling alive. I think that they should just go to a person like me or one of these individuals and just ask them about it. Go to a club, organization, something, find out a little bit about it. And if you want to, I mean, everyone has an extra sled just sitting around. Ask them to go ride. So what I hear you saying is that having relationships with other people who have sleds is important and being invited into the process is very important. How do you feel when, when the older adults invite you in and say, hey, come ride with us, hey, come to a club meeting, hey, come do something with us? Do, now, you're all smiling except you, Robert. There, there's a smile. Do, do you think it's like, yes, let's do this, or you think, oh, that's a lot of work? Do you, do you get excited about it because you already love the sport? Um, I get excited about snowmobiling just because um, I love to do it. It's a thing that I want to teach my kids when I get older and my, like have my husband do it with me. And um, it's just something that everyone should experience at least once in their life, no matter how old they are. Because I've seen lots of different age people here at the ISC, and it just makes me feel like, oh, I want to be like them when I get older and still doing it and still being involved. <laughs> yeah it's it's great when you're asked like it makes you feel a sense of pride that they value your opinion that much and see that you can be useful to the sport for them to invite you places and just want to have fun with you and so that's really cool i think it's just awesome that there's older people that actually see that you are involved and that you want to do more in the sport and you want to keep your generation going so one of the things I talked about um, at, at my first presentation at Congress was some, some important words. I call them journey words. And one of those important words that I, I, I think matters in life is the word gratitude. When older people invite you in and, and you, you help out with things and the rides, when they say thank you, does that feel special to you? Does that make you say, yes, keep going with this? And then another word that I think matters in all of life is the word optimism. And optimism to me means that in snowmobiling that, yes, we're going to have a great future. But to do that, we have to create it. 
and that's going to someday fall on all of you because you are the next generation. So what do you most recommend that we, that you do, that be done to create a great future for this sport? Just get more people involved with it so we can have more help and people and ideas to keep it going. Um, get snowmobiling out there, put positive things on Facebook and social media, because people are constantly on their phones. Um, definitely talk to people about it from your community. Be like, hey, we have this going on. Why don't you come out and see what it's about? Um, just keep like putting it out there that snowmobiling still is alive, and we want to encourage it more in the next generation. Yeah, kind of like what Rachel said, keep inspiring people to snowmobile. Yeah, snowmobiling is definitely a great sport, and just showing all the good things that snowmobilers do besides riding. I mean, how, ma how much we impact our communities and the charity events we hold, and just partnering with all those people and showcasing that to people is very important. I think it's very, very important that you get a newspaper from SDSA and put it in your school library, the public library, have the students look at it and just tell them there's meetings on Saturday, why don't you come and see what it's about and then see if they'll help you with trail signs or something simple, I mean, it's easy. Well, I think you've heard some amazing ideas from some amazing kids from, of course, this amazing place called South Dakota. Um, thank, thank you, each of you, for, for your time and for sharing your ideas. And then my last question for you is, some of the people that will be hearing this Saturday aren't the ones who are really good on Facebook, aren't the ones who are really good with some of this. Are you willing to do more? Would you be willing to help with Facebook and, and teach other people how to do some of those fun things? So there you have, you have workers who are willing to say, let us, let us help with the social media stuff because it is essential in today's communication. So thank you, each and every one of you, so much. I appreciate it. I really believe in that simple formula of ask, listen, and then solve together. I also ask adults about what they would hope for the future of snowmobiling and what some folks here told me this week was they hope to attract more youth. So do you see the common theme here between both groups? The youth say, yes, we want to, and adults say we need more youth. Adults also said they hope the sport's still around in 10, 15, 20 years. And they hope it grows in popularity and that more people are involved. Some journey words that I think help in this whole process of creating the future is, one is expectations. And to me, expectations is um, when you can inspire a commitment that ensures success. You can inspire people to, to step up and, and do more. But I think leaders also need to look at expectations from the perspective of members, whether they're adults or kids. So I don't know if you have the book Journey Words with you. If you do, you can use that. Otherwise, I'd like you to look at this list from page, I believe it's page 52 in the book, 56 in the book. And I'd like you to, with your partner, look at these two lists of expectations that relate to member service. And which ones do you think, what are the top two or three for members, and what do you think of the top two or three for kids? And I'll tell you what people said this week. So talk with your partner. Look at this list and, and say, what do, you, what do you think is most important? Thank you again for that discussion. And while I hate to cut off discussion, um, we, we can't go for three hours, but we'll go for only two and a half more hours, I promise. Just kidding. But this is a discussion that I would hope that you would have with your leadership of, of your clubs of your associations, what do members expect? What do kids expect? And my list is not gonna be scientific, but here's what I heard when we had the member, um, creating um, great member service yesterday. Here's what people in, in that group said they believe their members are looking for. Um, meetings that are, that are brief with agendas, to the point. Um, if you haven't heard this before, remember this. In today's world, time matters more than money for a lot of people. And so if you say you're going to have an hour-long meeting, then, then that's a promise you are making to your members. 
So you don't want to go on for 90 minutes if you said an hour. You've got to manage those meetings. And that came across from them pretty loud and clear. By the way, this is being taped. Somebody just asked me for a DVD of this. And uh, Kim said they're all being recorded and somehow they're going to figure out how to make this available. And I don't know what that means. Sorry, I don't know the details. But So this stuff, take pictures if you want. But, and if you want my PowerPoint, that's great too. But um, what they also said was they want a plan. Why does a plan matter to anybody who says, I'm a member? It says that as leaders, you have looked down the road. And that's one of the top four things that makes you, the leader, worth following. You have been thinking this out. It makes you a less, less of a risk. That's what we loved about Mickelson. He had a plan. It wasn't just, oh yeah, go make it a billion dollar industry. We had a plan for that. So having any kind of a plan for your club, for your association, where are you going? Transparency. And I probed that a little bit. I, th I think it just really means just being very open and honest with, with plans and with the books and with numbers. But, but I also think what they're saying is they don't want a ton of detail or unnecessary detail or a ton of minutia because nobody can keep all that. I mean, you can be the most brilliant person. At some point, you're going to get overloaded. So your meeting should be just kind of the high-level stuff. You got heavy-duty stuff, take care of that in your committees. Committees should work on the details and then say, this is what we would like to propose. Members want engagement. We talked about that a lot. And I said to the group, you know, I'm not real good with names. I haven't been forever, and it's not getting any better at this age. And so for me, walking into a group and having name tags and being able to see the names helps me engage. And we talked about how important that is to feel then connected to this group. And relationships. That word is a journey word, and that word just so matters. Relationships are built on, you know, on promises and on expectations. And then members expect current, accurate information. Whatever that means in your world. That could be from where the snow is to information about events. But that's, that's just the list I got out of yesterday's session. What do you think your members expect in your group? And, and have that discussion. And then what the youth said that they expect, what makes it easier to be part of things was to be acknowledged and be noticed. Well, that's innate for all of us. We want what we do to be noticed. Kids do. They want to be listened to with their ideas. They don't want to hear, oh, we tried that 10 years ago. Or, oh, well, you know, no, that just won't work. That, those are shutdown phrases. I call them killer phrases. And the, you want kids offering ideas. That says that they're owning it. And if you want kids to own it and become your future, then you've got to let them have some, some say in how things run. Respect, that's just, that's critical. Praise and credit, working side by side. They, those kids from Wisconsin, especially, they get working side by side with you. They see you as being talented, knowledgeable, you, you know a lot, and they want to pick your brains. They want to work with you. And they want to be treated as equal. I heard this phrase from somebody, don't make me earn my spot. Don't make me work so hard to earn it. Just give me some credit for where I'm at right now that I showed up. Make sense? How important is this word, communication? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's huge. And for your world, I want you to think about this as, you know, telling your story with, with passion. So I'm going to give you a quick chance to have passion this morning. What's your passion level like? Okay, raise it up. <laughs> raise it up. And... Uh, Tell each other your best damn story from the last year or two of riding a sled. Tell it to somebody at your table. Tell a great story about your day on a trail someplace. Your day in a meadow, your day getting stuck. I don't care what it is, but with passion, I want to see you guys telling your story. So get, get into it. Passion. Thank you for sharing your stories. Again, I hate to cut you off because... Your energy and your smiles and your hand motions and I didn't see anybody fall on the floor so everybody was safe in your stories. That, that passion is something that inspires people and you've got to have that. And when you tell your stories, I mean I think that's what the kids are saying too, you know, share those stories with us. 
But communication as a leader is also about some other things. And something I heard this week was that, you know, when you communicate as a leader, being accurate, keeping your members informed. Wow, that really rose to the top of the list so quickly yesterday. Being informed about events and what's going on and where it's happening. And, and using your websites to keep people updated. Using your Facebook page. And my goodness, let those kids take off on those Facebook pages for you. Yesterday, somebody after the... I think they were from New York. We were talking after the session about memories. Memories on the trail. And what you just told were stories that are about memories. And she was saying... Um, some of the best memories are with stone building with her dad. Well, my head is never too far from what can we do with that in, in the marketing world. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, everybody, every club could run a Facebook themed Father's Day thing where you post pictures of you riding with your dad. And wouldn't that be one of those emotional tugs that help us remember why we love this sport? So think about doing that. It wouldn't be hard. And if you don't know how to do it, have a kid do it for you. <laughs> they know how. Communication is so much about listening. Remember that great leaders are just good people who listen really well. And that listening helps build those authentic relationships. It's easy to trust a person who really listens to you in a way that they want to get what you're saying. And then fun. <laughs> fun. And so when you have your meetings, you know, go ahead and ask people to share their best stories and, and have them connect and engage. So it's just more fun. Relationships, we talked about that the other day. Building partnerships to reach your goals, how critically important that is in this world. You heard that out of the mouths of those kids. The kids from South Dakota were talking about the relationships with Game Fish and Parks. Hello? I mean, I'm in tourism thinking, well, we're doing this stuff. Oh, yeah, it's called partnerships. <laughs> I didn't know. We were just doing it. Those kids have that awareness. That's huge. Youth relationships, they want your support. And any kid who steps up and look at this group, okay? Look at you. Look around the room. Take a look around. Imagine now being 13, 14, 15 and walking in here. Hi! It's a little intimidating, people. It's a little intimidating because of your experience, because of what you know, you've got the titles. So they want your support to be able to be there and feel welcomed. And they want to be accepted. We all do. They want you to be willing to adapt a little bit to what they recommend. And they want to work with you. With you is one of those key phrases, OK? So it takes some courage to do all this. We talked about courage and perseverance to create the future you desire for your kids and your grandkids and their kids and their grandkids. I mean, I hope this stuff lasts so long that, you know, someday when, when Kelsey has kids and she takes them riding someplace that she has to check and see if they have panties on or not. I don't know. I just really hope it goes that long, forever and ever. The kids talked about in their session what they got from this leadership program in Wisconsin. And what I, I just took notes on what they said. And they said that they got these presentation skills. These kids can now stand up and talk to groups. Well, that's pretty darn good at that age, you know? They know how to run meetings. They've had practice with that. They have these leadership camps where they learn how to run meetings. They learn how to communicate. They've learned how to build teams. They've learned how to lead. And plus, the kids said, now get this, the kids said, lifelong friends. Isn't that what you guys have in this room? Give yourselves a round of applause for all the friendships you have in this room. It's huge. It's huge. And so you've got kids using that phrase. Now courage also can look like a pink tractor that celebrates what you've overcome in life. So all of you who have struggled with hard stuff, that's for you. And that courage that you have, that perseverance, remember how that inspires others. So you want to be that leader who inspires the best in people. I love Katherine Hepburn as an actress. And I don't know, maybe 15 years ago now, she wrote her autobiography. 
and she titled it Me. And she tells great stories in her book about growing up in New England. Both her parents were doctors and, and about how you know, she wore pants when most women were wearing dresses. And she was just, in my mind, a real kick-ass woman. And I, I liked her style a lot. Well, shortly after she wrote her autobiography, Snoopy from the Peanuts comic strip was on top of his doghouse writing his autobiography. And the title Snoopy gave it was Me Too. And that's what happens when you bother to show up with your own authentic inspiration. It inspires others to say, yeah, me too, I want to be like that. Those kids are saying they want to be like you. That's huge. You know, your future is in good hands with that. Your future is in good hands. We just have got to make those connections with those kids. They're, they're everywhere. <laughs> and... Um, and by the way, speaking of inspiration, apparently this picture inspired many, many of you to order this pair of pants from me. And, and, I, and I, one of the surprise orders that I got was from Ed for a pink pair. And, and Ed, I'm sorry, I, would you come up here, Ed? Come up here, Ed. <laughs> come here, Ed. Come all the way up here. <laughs> It's really hard sometimes to get things done in a hurry. And so I just couldn't quite get the pants done, but here's your present. You can open it in front of everybody. Because you, you're really, you have courage, Ed. Well, I kind of do. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Isn't that pretty? It's a man bag. <laughs> It's a man, it is a man bag? It's a man bag for you, Ed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> a little memory from ISC, from the shorts. And, and Greg, yours are in, in the works. They'll be pink. They're not here yet. Not, not yet, but they, they will be. So remember that how important inspiration is. And, and then some of the last words I want to share with you, optimism. My biggest concern for you is that when I asked some of you about the future of snowmobiling, several of you said, well, I hope it's still around in 20 or 30 years. You have to be more optimistic than that. You have to believe it's going to happen. And, you ha and I know that you're working hard to make it happen, so put in, kick in that gear of, yes, we can. Because an optimist can see the opportunity even in this. Raise your hand if you have a friend like that who before they help you, they have the camera out. Yeah. Great, great friends, right? Yeah. You just really got to appreciate people like that. And then gratitude. Being grateful for, for the kids, for the members you have. Remember to count your blessings in this world and not take it for granted. Those beautiful scenes, the places you get to ride. And to remember, yeah, we all pray for snow. And the machines and the access and the safety so you can keep sharing that journey that you love with those that you love. So practice gratitude as leaders. I will love this quote. The attitude of gratitude is one of the most important and most life-changing. It, it really can help you be a better leader. And then quality. Quality just inspires excellence in others by you showing up every day, every meeting, writing every agenda the best you can, every time. And I love this picture. And Deming was from Wyoming. He went to Japan and helped them resurrect their economy in what the 70s, 80s, 80s. And he said, simply, quality is everybody's business. And it is. Wherever you're at in your club or your association, doing your best will make a difference. And that's why, as leaders, you need to be grateful for what people do and, and say thank you. Say thank you. So we've been here this week to celebrate your leadership journey. How are we doing? Do you feel like you can? Yeah. Do you feel like you could get in touch with more kids and find them and convince them to, get, to be part of what you're doing? I hope so, because I think they are your future. And, you know, some of those kids don't even know that, you, that they are your future. They don't know it. But if you connect with them and talk with them, you might be able to convince them. So um, that's what Mount Rushmore looks like when the fireworks used to go off. Pretty cool, pretty cool sight. So if you agree with these statements, please say out loud with me, yes, we can, okay? 
Can we create a great future for snow snowmobiling by working together with everybody in this room? If so, say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Can we create a great future for snowmobiling by working with the youth throughout America and, and Canada? If so, say, yes, we can. And can you have a last kick-ass day of Congress and go home and spread this message and be the best leader you can be? If so, say, yes, we can. Because you can. It's your journey. Remember, this leadership journey starts with each of you. It just starts with each of you. And then it goes out. And you create your future by how you are today. Okay? Have a great rest of Congress. Thank you. It's been such an honor to have time with you guys. Thank you so much.